one more time before he comes back in February. Come on. He's coming back in February 2015. Uh, 15, and I, I said, are you coming? We didn't know if he was coming for three days, four days, so we just agreed two weeks. Yeah, all right. But give Evangelist Joe Olden one more lighthouse. God bless you. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys. God bless you. You can be seated. What an honor it's been here uh, to be here this past weekend. Uh, you know, your pastor did something for me that I don't nobody's ever done. He bought me an Alabama bomber jacket. Do you see that jacket that I'm wearing? <laughs> I, I'll get so sweaty preaching with this. Just for a minute, okay. You wanted to get a picture of me in it, right? Let's get let's get the camera out because it's I get so sweaty. You got it? I don't know what they're thinking. Facebook, but I don't do Facebook. Okay. Here we go. Here's one here. Okay, dirt, turn around. Need to see the back. There we go. Put your head over there. I don't know what you're doing. Whatever you did, don't put it on Facebook. When I got there, he had a he had a bottle of detergent, tied detergent. I thought, man, I'm only going to be here a few days. Man, I you know. When I was on the Indiana tour, I really could have used it. I was here about two weeks. And then I saw a couple of rolls of toilet paper. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I, I could run out in three days. God bless him. I mean, if I have, a, if I have some, you know, some stuff hitting my stomach wrong. But, uh, but then I noticed it was roll, tide, roll. Look at this. How many of you have been here in every service so far? Just wave at me. Look at that. Praise God. Praise God. Tonight, I believe that everyone under the sound of my voice is here under a divine appointment. I want everyone to put their hand on their heart. And I want you to do this with sobriety. I want you to say this after me. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart and change my life in Jesus name amen what I'm gonna preach to you tonight is, is not um, just something flippant I believe it's a word from God for this house in this season at this time uh, I'm gonna be talking to you about three different individuals tonight but if I had a title for tonight's message it would be this Will you host the Holy Ghost? Because if you host him, he will stay. I want you to, if you have your Bibles with you, to turn with me to the book of 2 Kings in chapter 4. 2 Kings in chapter 4. We're going to start with verse 8. One day Elijah went to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold, now I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room for him on the roof with walls and put therein him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp so, what, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go up there. Now, this woman urged Elisha to stay. There was some urgency down in her spirit and in her soul for Elisha to stay in her house when he came to town. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out upon all flesh. Acts 2 had not happened yet. 
Therefore, God chose his prophets and his priests, and he would put a special mantle, a special anointing on these individuals. So whenever Elisha came to her house, she would sense, feel, identify something different that was on him than when she'd go to church on a regular basis. Something was different when he came to town than when she would pray by herself. There was something different in the atmosphere of her house when he would walk in than any other time. And so she would cook for him whatever he liked to eat. I believe that she asked Elisha, how do you like your eggs? How do, you, do you like wheat toast or do you like white toast? I believe she said, do you like orange juice or milk? I, I believe one of the first times maybe Elisha showed up, she had orange juice and he said, you know, I really like milk. And the first thing she did is she went and got the best milk that she could find. So when Elisha stopped back by, she didn't serve him orange juice. She served him fresh milk. She cooked everything just like he liked it. You know how Elisha felt? He felt honored, and he felt welcomed, and he felt like she wanted him there. She, he felt like she was a good host. So out of all the places Elisha could have stopped whenever he came to her town, he didn't stop anywhere else. He went to her house. Why? Because she honored him. Why? Because she hosted him. If Pastor Ralph, excuse me, if a pastor uh, said to me, hey, I'm coming uh, through Dallas uh, in a few weeks, and I just said, hey, why don't you stop by? Why don't you come by and see me? I'll throw my address at you. And he did just that. He pops by about 7.30 on a Thursday night and said, hey, I'm going to San Antonio. You said stop by anytime. And I opened the door, and I stood in the doorway, and I looked at my watch. How many of you think that he would feel hosted well how many of you think that he'd feel honored and I said boy it's pretty late I didn't think you'd stop by how many of you think pastor would stop by my house the next time he went to San Antonio no because I didn't make him feel comfortable because I didn't host him I want to tell you Jesus the Holy Spirit God he wants us to host him he actually wants us to arrange our life in everything we do to be a host to his presence and his spirit upon our life she hosted him and then she tells her husband you know he comes by here and eats every time he comes to town this visitation has been wonderful it's wonderful when he comes to eat. It's wonderful when he fellowships with us. It's wonderful as he sits down and reclines, but he doesn't have a place to stay here. So all he can do is visit from week to week or month to month. He stops by, and my heart feels so empty after he leaves. Honey, let's build a room for him. Let's pull some money out of savings. Let's make a sacrifice. Let's rearrange our life because I want our life to represent one thing, and that is hosting the presence of Christ. I want to host God in my house. I want to tell you, to, to do construction work on your house, it's no small feat. She had to tear a hole in the roof, build a set of stairs. She had to spend a lot of money. She, had to re she told her son, we can't go to soccer practice every night like we once were because something greater than soccer has come to our home. It's greater than baseball. It's greater than football. We've taken sports and entertainment and our children and turned them into gods. They keep us out of church. They keep us out of prayer meeting. They keep our devotions low because they want to play sports. I want to tell you, uh, sports is great. I'll let my kids play sports. I'll encourage them to play sports and I'll cheer them to play sports. But they, it will not take the place of prayer. It won't take the house of God, take the place of the house of God, nor revival. She said, let's build him a room. Let's put a bed in it. Let's put a chair in it. So that whenever he comes here, he doesn't leave. She was saying literally, this visitation has been wonderful. But I want to create an atmosphere for a habitation. Are you creating an atmosphere in your house? Are you creating an atmosphere in your car, in your church? Will you host him? Because if you host him, he'll stay. He wants to feel well. Sometimes when God visits a church, I think he just sticks his head in on Sunday. We all feel the power of God. People leave to go eat chicken. They get on their phone and begin to text. They start talking to one another. They don't revere it as a holy moment. 
they take the presence flippantly. They have no respect to the presence of God walking in and out of the sanctuary. You know, I'm not trying to be legalistic here, but God wants us to honor Him. If the President of the United States walked in, we wouldn't get on Facebook and or the governor of our state or a legislator or a senator walked in. We wouldn't just act anyway. We would honor. And if you say, well, I don't like the president, I wouldn't honor him, then you need to get right with God. Because God wants us to honor our leaders, whether you voted for him or not. There's a certain measure of respect that we give to leaders. How much more should we respect the Holy Spirit? The greatest being on earth... She said, I want to host him. She created a room for him and he stayed. The presence of God settled on that house. See, many churches in America, they understand visitation. They know what it is. They've been in services where God has visited but there are few churches in history that have ever positioned themselves for a habitation. We were doing a revival in Austin, Texas. I was supposed to be there one service. I was there about two months. And I called Jerry Hill, Evangelist Steve Hill's wife. She was, he was still alive at the time, but he was sick. And I said, I said, Jerry, revival's broken out at a church that I'm at. And I began to tell her, and she, not arrogantly, but with humility, said, she said, Joe, everywhere Steve would go, that would happen, every service. But the difference between Brownsville and all the others was this. She said, when revival broke out at Brownsville, she said 95% of the church came every night for three months. They hosted, they incubated, they tended, they waited upon, they hungered after, they desired, they made a sacrifice for the world to come and drink. 95% of the church, she said not one person on the worship team complained. No deacons complained. The staff didn't complain. They were all hungry for a move of God. You know, it's easy to say, I want revival. I'd like revival. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? A, a saved Lutheran wants revival. A saved Baptist or a Catholic or Episcopalian. I've never met any believer that did not want revival. But I've met many that can say it flippantly and never pay the price. You say, I'd like to have a Corvette. I think Corvettes are beautiful. But there's a large price you got to pay to drive a Corvette. You got to pray the price. Are you so hungry for revival you get up and you pray for revival every day? Are you so hungry for revival that you don't let certain programs come through your television set because you don't want to quench the Holy Spirit? You know, all revival is is every household in the house getting pure. And when we come together, there's a corporate expression of purity and holiness. Are you hosting him? Do you want him to stay? Because if you host him, he will. If he sees your heart burning to make every sacrifice and every adjustment and everything that God would say to this house, he won't just visit you anymore. He'll land He'll stay. I've been listening to Duncan Campbell. And he would talk about the revival at Hebrides. And he would say when God would come into the room. In Hebrides, the police stations were filled because conviction hit the entire city and everybody was lining up confessing the things that they had stolen and the crimes that they had committed. Revival had hit the city. God, I'm hungry for revival tonight. Would some of you in this place right now just get to a place where you forget about who's sitting beside you? You forget about who's around you? 
and how you've always done it. And just right now in your soul, just agree with what I'm saying and begin to pull on the Spirit of God. The Bible says, you don't have to turn there in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 2, And David arose and went with the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out to the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ohio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark and took hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down because of his error, and he died beside the ark of God. A lot of excitement, 30,000 men dancing. There's not a preacher in America that wouldn't point to that and say that's revival. But God said that's not revival. It looked like revival. It smelled like it. They were excited, not about riches, not about treasure. They were excited that that ark represented the presence of the Lord and they were going to bring it back to Jerusalem. They were dancing and shouting, I don't believe personally that Uzzah was a sinful man. But he touched God inappropriately. And the presence of God was never meant to be toted around by oxen. It was meant to be carried by human flesh. And the scary part about this whole story is why did Abinadab why was the ark in Abinadab's house? Why wasn't where it was supposed to be? Why didn't Saul go get the ark? Because he was used to doing church without the presence. The priests would do the religious acts. They do their ceremonies. They do the sacraments. They do it the way they'd always done. But no presence was in the room. It didn't bother Saul that the presence wasn't there. It didn't, it didn't grieve his spirit that God wasn't moving in their midst as long as they had their ritual. There are thousands of churches all over the United States of America that have their ritual and a religious program every week without the presence. But David, when he became king, the Bible says in Psalms 27, One thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the presence of the Lord for all the days of my life and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord in the temple. He said, I've got to get the presence. I, I just want the presence. He didn't get his kingdom in order. He didn't do many things that a king or a leader would do uh, as a prerequisite. He said, I'm about one thing. My kingdom's going to be marked with one thing, the primary thing, the chief thing, the only thing. It's his presence. We've got to get the ark. Because if we can ever get the ark to Jerusalem, we'll have the presence of God in the nation. If we can ever get the presence of God back in the church, we'll have the presence of God in the nation. He touched the ark. He fell dead. David, the Bible said, feared the Lord. You see, sometimes God does certain things to get us ready for something that he wants to do. David didn't know what was coming, but God was bringing great sobriety to him so that he could handle what he was about to do. They took the ark and they left it at Obed-Edom's house. Why they chose Obed-Edom, I don't know. But when they left it there, David went back and he began to read, how do you handle the ark? What does the book say? What did Moses say? Let's reinstitute the priests and the Levites. 
And then David heard that everything that Obed-Edom had got bigger and better. His tomatoes were bigger, his, his, his oxen and his cows, his cows produced more, his female goats produced double. Everything began to double in his house. And David said, I knew it, it's that ark. We've got to get it. Hear this with sobriety, church. Hear this. God, I pray that this would resonate in our soul, what I'm about to say, and it just wouldn't go in one ear and out the other. Imagine being one of those priests. And David sat down with you and said, you're the one that's going to pick it up. What? Yeah, you're going to pick it. You're a priest. You're going to go through the religious ceremony with a pure heart. It's not going to be a ceremony. It's going to be holy. And you're going to do a ceremonial cleansing of your sin. You're going to put the ephod on. You're going to put the white robe on. And you're going to go pick the ark up. Listen to me. How many of you would just run into Obed-Edom's house after God just killed Uzzah and be ready to grab it? I believe he sat down with his family and said, guys, I know the last person that touched it died. I've been chosen. Maybe his wife and kids wept. And he looked at him and said, it hadn't been good under the watch of Saul. When Samuel was alive, the presence of God was thick. But since he's died and Saul is ruling, the presence of God has departed. But God has given us a man named David who's hungry, who's thirsty. His only desire is have, to have the presence, and I've been chosen. Now listen to me, honey. Listen to me, guys. I'd rather die than not have the presence. sobriety he didn't walk in there flipping he wasn't texting on the way he wasn't co- cutting side jokes I don't believe he said a word he was reverent one thing the Catholics do have in their churches is reverence they took the ark they hoisted it and they put it on their shoulders They took six steps. David killed an oxen and a fattened animal, the Bible says. Every six feet, two sacrifices were made. I believe that's where the psalm originated. I refuse to bring me, to bring God a sacrifice that cost me nothing. Every six feet, they stepped, they stopped. It was a long procession. It was a bloody road. To humanity, it had to look as if the wildest occurrence was happening in people's front yard. Oxen were screaming. Cattle were yelling. All of the cattle and animals they must have had, the knives, the blood, the sacrifice. In America, it's hard to get people to sacrifice anymore. They got it to Jerusalem. David began to celebrate and dance with all of his might before the Lord. David did not realize what he was giving birth to. Guys, God is looking to and fro for a place in America to abide. David had no idea that after they got the ark to Jerusalem, the visible, manifest, Shekinah glory of God was going to drop. And everybody could see it the Gentile and the Jew could walk to the ark 
and see the glory of God. Isn't that what the church is supposed to be? Shouldn't it be that if the sinner and the saint walks in the house, it's different than walking into Walmart? It's different than walking into Hardee's or O'Charlie's or Starbucks. That it's different. There is a manifest presence of God. The bricks aren't holy. The wood's not holy. But there is something sacred about the house of God. And people should know it when they walk in the door. Shouldn't someone shouldn't have to say the presence of God is here. We should let the sinner declare it if it's here or not. When I was in sin, I knew God was in the house. I knew when he was and I knew when he wasn't. For 33 years, I had a revival. God did something drastic because he knew that David was about to turn a corner and he was going to have a perspective that he'd never had before. I believe in America the church is about to turn a corner. David was hungry. Shumanite woman was hungry. Moses. Moses' first encounter with God could go down at many individuals would be their greatest encounter they ever had in their life. Saw a bush that was on fire. And a voice began to speak, called him, gave him an assignment. He took his shoes off because it was holy ground. God said, go face Pharaoh and set the people of Israel, set the Hebrews free. One man, Moses, against the strongest army and strongest dictator the world had known. Go set the people free. Moses, throw your rod down. Throw your staff on the ground. It became a snake. Pick it up. It became a rock. Moses, take your hand. Put it in your cloak. It went from clean to leprous. Stick it in again. Leprous to clean. I'm with you, Moses. Moses could have wrote a book right there. He went to Pharaoh. Ten miracles. Ten plagues. Ten signs. He did it in front of them. He threw the rod down, became a snake. He picked it back up. He prayed frogs filled the place. He prayed uh, locusts filled the place. He prayed the, the Nile turned to blood. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. The Spirit of God was on Moses. The people of God were set free. They came to the Red Sea. They looked behind them, and the army that had just had them in bondage for 400 years was going to kill them. Moses cried out to God and the Red Sea split. Imagine that manifestation. The, 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 the presence and the power and the electricity of God that was moving through Moses and everybody that saw it. Supernatural. They got to the other side of the sea and their enemies had fall slain. The water covered them. They said, Moses, we're hungry. We don't have anything to eat. Moses prayed and manna fell from heaven. They said, Moses, we need a little bit more than manna for our diet. Moses prayed and and thousands of quail hit the camp. They said, we don't know how to get around here, Moses. So the Shekinah glory of God manifested and led them by day. What about night? A pillar of fire led them where to go. Guys, this is powerful. The Bible says when Moses would go to the tent of meeting, the Shekinah glory of God would fall on him. The people were sick. He erected a statue, and when they looked at it, they were healed. The water was bitter, and it became sweet through the hand of Moses. Moses was guiding two million people. Outside of Jesus Christ, there wasn't a more powerful man of God on earth. The supernatural power that he moved and ministered in. 
listen to me, church. He got towards the end. And he said, God, he could have he sat down, wrote best-selling books. He could have leaned back and said, I've done more than anybody that up to my lifetime. I've been there and I've done that. The glory of God fills my tent. I can put my hand through the glory. I'm continually filled with the presence of God. But all that did was fuel him. And at the end of his life, he said, God, I'm not satisfied with where I'm at. If Moses wasn't satisfied with where he was, I'm definitely not satisfied with where I'm at. He goes to the top of the mountain. He said, God, show me your glory. It's about time some of you in this place, you forget about what God has done and what he did do. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that when you saved me, you set me free from drugs and delivered me, but that day's over. Lord, I am so, I'm, I am forever thankful for the Brownsville revival. God, I'm forever thankful for sitting with evangelist Steve Hill over and over again as he mentored me. God, I'm thankful for the encounters. Lord, I'm thankful that when I've laid hands on the blind, they saw. I'm thankful, God, for the deaf that hear. I'm thankful, Lord, that I've watched cancer be broken off of lies and scoliosis pop into place and creative miracles happen before our eyes. Lord, thank you for that. But today is October 5th, 2014. So many times people in the church are stuck in what God did. Moses never lived in a day of what God did do. He wanted more. Is there anybody here tonight that walked in here that you're just hungry for the glory of God? You're just thirsty. Didn't come here for preaching. You didn't come here for singing. You come here to meet with God. I, I remember when I first got saved, year or two into it, my pastor not at Brownsville, another church. I would go back to my home church where I got saved every single Sunday. I never went to Brownsville Assembly of God while I was there on a Sunday. I always would go back to my home church. Well, they were in revival. Wouldn't you have been blessed? Yeah, but my church wasn't in revival, and I wanted them to have it. So I was an intercessor. I would pray hours a day for that church and, and, and for different, just for God to move. The pastor could preach on something. It didn't matter what he preached on. It didn't matter what the altar call was. He fell into sin around this time. I'm not going to go into all that. But he would close a service, no presence, no altar call, no worship, and I'd go by myself. And I'd lay on my face to cry out. Why? Because I didn't come to hear a sermon. I didn't come to hear a song. I come to meet with Jesus. People would walk over me. People would mock me. What a defamation, the praying guy. What a defamation, the guy that's thirsty for revival. And I would weep. When's the last time you just broke down by yourself at the end of a service and you didn't move an inch until God released you when was the last time you buckled over and you didn't weep just for an encounter you didn't weep you just wept that God would bring revival to America and your church you were so burdened you felt the gripping of God that's the only way revival is going to come not through a speaker not through a song. I mean, if revival is predicated on pastors praying, this church would be in revival. 
I know pastors all over America, they cry out, they fast, and they pray their church isn't in revival because their church hadn't gotten in line with the burden for revival. We, we talk about revival rhetoric. We say, oh, how concerned we are, rhetoric. There's a big difference between concern and being hungry for change. There's a big difference between concern and anguish. Nehemiah wasn't concerned. He was baptized in anguish for God to do something. A lot of times we, we, we kind of play chase with God. We chase Him a little bit, but we never get in hot pursuit. You know, in Asia they have people that hunt tigers and track tigers. If you see a tiger track, there's a lot of things you can tell about the track. You can tell how big it was, how much it weighed possibly, how long it was since it's been there, what gender it was, what direction it was going in. But there is a monumental difference between looking at a tiger track and seeing the tiger. It goes to another level. I'm tired of tracking. I want to find. You know what preachers are good at. I'm, I'm good at this. I was in a revival. 500 a night saved. Imagine that for five years. Imagine this church being at capacity in every room in this church filled with people. And every call that was given, 500 people got born again. And the service lasted till 2 a.m. And it wasn't hype, it wasn't lingering, it was an open heaven of God. That's the way Brownsville was. But I'm tired of talking about revivals. You know what preachers are good at? You know what I'm good at? Talking to preachers about what God did. You know, how many of you have ever built a righteous bonfire? A few of you. Okay. In Alabama, we would build them. I mean, one day, they cut down so many pine trees in our neighborhood, they piled them all up in somebody's yard just in his, I think, 50 pine trees, gas, and they lit it on. I talk about a bonfire. When a bonfire is blazing, you can't just walk right up to it and say, I'd like to toast a marshmallow. Your fingernails would melt. But you can go to bed, camp out, go to bed, get up the next day, look at it, walk over to it, see it smoldering, see a flicker of the flame and kick the log that was burning the night before. That's what a lot of us do. We talk about something that used to burn, but you can hardly see the flicker anymore. Let, let, me, let me say, John, John G. Lake, John, let me tell you who John G. Lake was. He, they put plagues on his hand and it would die. He raised the dead. He moved in miracle power. But Smith Wigglesworth and John G. Lake books and William Seymour and Evan Roberts and Duncan Campbell and Leonard Ravenhill and David Wilkerson and Steve Hill books, they were never meant to to, to satisfy the appetite, they were meant to put salt on your tongue. Is anybody hungry tonight? Is anybody thirsty tonight? God told Moses, my presence will go with you. And it was like, that's a non-negotiable. He said, what else is going to distinguish us? I want more than your presence. I want to see you. God, show me your glory. Is there anybody tonight that's hungry for the glory of God? You're thirsty. Lord, I, I pray, God, that you release an anointing in individuals tonight that's beyond what they've ever experienced, known, or thought of, God. Release a divine desperation deep down on the midst of who we are. Go deep right now. 
would you just begin to forget about who's beside you right now? Forget about who's around you. Why did David, why did David want to go get the ark so bad? The Bible doesn't say this, but I'm sure this is what happened. Samuel would tell him about how good it was. He'd be in a service with David. And Samuel would say, I never heard anybody lead worship like you do, David. But it's, it's, it compares to nothing like it was in the ark. When I was next to the ark, there's nothing that can describe it. And he got tired of hearing stories. How many of you are tired of hearing stories about revivals of yesteryear? You're tired of hearing people talk about Brownsville and Azusa, the Hebrides, the Cane Ridge. Boy, I tell you, a revival uh, a few hundred miles south of here was probably the strongest move of God this nation has possibly ever known, the first camp meeting, the Cane Ridge Revival. Thousands would come. Episcopalians would stand up and preach, and hundreds would be slain in the spirit, in the woods. Look it up. I'm tired of reading about Cane Ridge. How about a Richmond? How about a Richmond? Moses said, Lord, thank you for the burning bush. Thank you for splitting the Red Sea. Thank you for setting millions free. Thank you for the rod. Thank you for the miracles. Thank you for the manna. Thank you for the fire. Thank you for the glory. Thank you for the Shekinah that falls on me every time I pray. Thank you for shaking the mountain. Thank you for everything you've done, God, but I'm not satisfied. I'm respectful and I'm honoring God, but everything you've done, it's just gave me an appetite and my spirit says, if you've done that, you can do so much more. Would somebody forget about who's sitting beside you right now? Forget about how you've always done it, how it's always been done. Is there a Jacob in the house that says, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Is there a Bartimaeus in the house that says, I'm so hungry for what you can do and the world hasn't done it. Doctors haven't been able to do it. And the near of God, he was passing by and Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped everything to get to him. Why? Because he was shouting? No, because he was hungry. Because he was desperate. He took his desperation and he put it on display. He didn't care about peer pressure. He didn't care about the way everybody's done it before. He didn't care what anybody else would say. He didn't care about any snicker. He wanted God and he wanted him right now. And he was willing to shout it, stop it. He didn't care. God answered him. Zacchaeus ran up a tree. He, he, let, he left his dignity at his tax table. He ripped his Armani suit. He, 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 people snickered and snared at him, but he saw God. How many of you have come to see him tonight? Lord, thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for the miracles. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for this morning, God, but it's just wet my appetite to know if you, what you did this morning, you could do double tonight. But there's some people that's got to be hungry with me. You might out-preach me. You might out-sing me. But you won't outhunger me. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Somebody just lift their hands to the brassy heaven and begin to pull. Would somebody forget about what you've always done and how you've always done it? God, deep unto deep, God, I'm hungry. What makes man uncomfortable often makes God comfortable. God, if I'm going to keep doing and having what I've always had, I, I just take me to heaven right now, God. God, I want more. 
I don't want to be where I've been. God, I read stories in the Bible, and thank you for the stories, God. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for who you are. But God, I've never even seen a burning bush. God, would you show me your glory tonight? Would you begin to strike such a desperation in the midst of your people right now? My God, would some of you forget about who's around you and beside you? Some people don't like it when people begin to cry out. It makes them feel uncomfortable. If you'd have been in an Old Testament sacrifice, you talk about uncomfortable. What detested man attracted God? God is attracted to desperation. He's attracted to hunger. He's attracted to cries. He's attracted to desperation. He's attracted to when people cry out out of desperation and thirst and hunger. How hungry are you tonight? Your desperation is shallow. The touch of God on your life is going to be shallow. Some of you said today, I've never been touched by God this way in my entire life. Get desperate for God right now and he'll touch you beyond what he did this morning. Some of you even right now, you got to say, God, thank you for this morning, but there's got to be more. What would happen if this house got in unity for revival right now? When the glory of God really comes, people aren't just sitting, pondering, looking around, thinking about what they're going to do. Some of you need to forget about who's beside you right now and go after God. Sitting in your church pew hadn't got you set free and hadn't got the glory of God in your house. To, do, to get things you've never done before, you've got to do things you've never done before. Whoever controls the altar controls the outcome. Young people, my God, would you stop looking at me and go after God? Would you come and get on your face? Cry out. I've never gotten on my face. Try it. I've never come and got on my knees. Do it. I've never lifted my voice. Lift your voice. If you're thirsty for God, I want you to respond right now. If you're desperate for God, I want you to respond right now. Right now. Come on. You want revival? It was easy to say amen earlier. Yeah, amen. Amen, Joe, yeah. Come and birth it right now. Come and birth it right now. Where are the Jeremiah's? Where are the Daniel's? Where are the Bartimaeus's right now? Come on. Daddy, you need to lead your family up here and pray with them. Mama, you need to take your kids up to the altar because what you've been doing, it's not going to keep them saved. It's not going to keep them set free. You need to teach them how to pray. Be the priest of your house. Mama, be the breaker of your house. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, fire come in this house. Pray for the glory of God, saints. Just pray. Pray for the manifestation of God. Pray. 
pray. America's going to hell. This generation's going to hell. They're addicted to the spirit of this age. They're addicted to lust. They're addicted to immorality. They're addicted to entertainment. They're addicted to the same sex and opposite sex. They're addicted to every wind of doctrine. They're addicted. They're addicted to the spirit of this age. My God, the only thing that's going to break it is what we're beginning to do right now. They weren't addicted to it in the 40s and 50s because grandmothers and grandfathers, what we're doing tonight was totally normal for every service to end just like this. A cry to God. Well, what are we going to pray for, Joe? Revival and glory and a move of the Spirit. Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Come on, church, let's go after God. God, that you would send revival. God, that you would send revival. Lord, I thank you for the healing movement in the 50s, Lord. I thank you for the revivals of old. God, yesterday's gone. We need a revival today. Thank you for Brownsville and Azusa Street and the Smithton Revival in Wales, God. Thank you for Evan Roberts, Lord God. Thank you for Duncan Campbell, Jesus. God, but they're dead and those revivals are over. God, we need a new well in America right now. Why not Richmond, Indiana? Why not Lighthouse? Why not, God? Why not, God? Don't be like that king that only struck the ground three times and breakthrough could have come much greater. Strike the ground. Jeremiah didn't leave at midnight. He didn't leave at one. He wrestled with God through the entire night. And God mightily came upon him and changed his name and birthed the nation in his... Jesus. Jesus. Jesus.